Some of you know those. Yeah, thank you, Juliet. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you. Um, appreciate that so much. Let's, let's pray this morning together. And while we pray, let's remember our kids uh, next door. Let's say a special prayer for our, our leadership and our kids if they, if they have their first children's church as well. Let's bow our heads together. God in heaven, thank you, Lord, so much that we can come before you. Thank you that we've been able to express uh, so many forms of worship already here this morning. We lift you up and honor your name and, and who you are and what you've done for us. And Lord, we lift up our kids that are, uh, most of them at least, are, are next door and working with the team over there and, and getting to have their own unique experience. We just pray that you would bless them as they also learn more about you. Guide them. May your spirit be with them. And may your spirit be with us as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, always, always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Always good to be able to worship together. And it is a special, a special weekend for most of Christianity as we contemplate the most important element of our faith, and that is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I, too... Uh, kind of forgot that the kids were not going to be here, uh, and I had the same problem uh, when I pastored in Spokane. I still have a kids quiz, but normally I would call it a teen trivia when the kids aren't here during children's church. Uh, so we're going to uh, call this a teen trivia, and I, so I want the young people still primarily, not the teen at heart, Dan, okay, not the kid at heart, but let's give, uh, let's give the teens at least a chance to participate in this little interactive part of the message, okay? So these are all going to be related to the, the theme of the resurrection of Christ and resurrection in general. Jesus' resurrection was not the first resurrection, right? We know that. There were several resurrections that take place in the Bible uh, before his. Can you remember anyone raised to life uh, in the Bible aside from Jesus? Juliet. Yeah, that one girl, that one time, and that one story. Okay, Jairus' daughter, you got it. I knew you were, see, I knew, exactly. See see how easy this is? So Jairus' daughter, and if someone else raises their hand, well, what about that one guy? Fredzi? Lazarus, probably the most famous resurrection other than the resurrection of Christ because of the story that goes with Lazarus and the intimate relationship and Jesus wept at the tomb and all that. So Lazarus, all right, we've got two of them. There's a few more. Come on now, let's think Old Testament for a second. Old Testament, you, you guys remember the stories? I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my eyes, I don't know how many young people we have on this side, most of them are over here. Um, I know Bob, we might have to go to some of our more seniors uh, here to get through this. Uh, Kenneth, I know, you, we'll give you a shot, Kenneth, thank you for helping out. All right, Elijah raised a widow's daughter, that's right, and I don't know her name, I don't think we know her name, we just know it was a widow and Elijah uh, was able to raise uh, the child back to life. Okay, there's someone that appeared uh, with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. Someone who died, uh, yet was miraculously alive. Najoni? Moses, see how smart. Where's our Bible teacher anyways? This is a, this, we need to work on, no, I'm just kidding, Pastor Zach. So Moses, Moses died, clearly he died, yet he is uh, uh, alive, and we see him at the Mount of Transfiguration, and there's this little thing in Jude that talks about the devil arguing about the resurrection of Moses. It's very interesting. Okay, uh, okay, we're going to have to go quickly here. Okay, all right, Mr. Simmons, we'll give you a chance. Oh, that's a funny one, too. So Elisha dies, and they have his bones, but yet this guy falls and touches the bones and springs the life. That's an incredible one. All right, let's just go through some of these. We mentioned Moses, and we went, mentioned the um, widow. The widow's son. All right, then what about Elisha? We talked about Elisha's bones. You guys are going to have to advance for me here, guys, because this isn't working. All right, the man who touched Elisha's bones. Okay, wonderful. And then in the New Testament, um, Juliet reminded us of Jairus' daughter. Um, and now there is another New Testament resurrection. A young man who was, they were actually having his funeral. You remember this one? I heard someone say it over here. Is that you, Rachel? 
No, not, we're not talking, we mentioned Lazarus. This is the widow of Nain is the place. The widow of Nain. Okay, then Lazarus. All right, and then Jesus, of course, would be the eighth. And then after Jesus, there's two more. So there's actually ten resurrections in the Bible. If you add them all up, Tabitha and Eutychus are raised in the book of Acts. So those are some resurrections. So all of those teach us something different about uh, how God uh, works in our lives. Um, I'm going to need you guys just to click it because this is not working. Or, or I don't know what it's going to become uh, challenging. Can someone maybe just sit there and, and advance it for me? So uh, Lisa... Thank you so much for helping out. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, we'll see between you and I if we can make this work. Now, I call this a natural disaster because if I just said what event or what happened, um, it might be confusing. But what natural disaster occurred both at the uh, death of Christ and at his resurrection? Was it a tornado, a flood? Okay, Paul. It was an earthquake. They are right. One at his death and one at the tomb. All right, very good. Now, another one. Whose tomb was Jesus buried in? It's kind of like who's buried in Grant's tomb type thing. Who, what tomb was Jesus buried in? Who owned that tomb? All right, Paul. Okay. Oh, right back here. Rachel? Joseph of Arimathea is the right one. Thank you so very much. Number four. You can click it for me, Lisa. All right, this is multiple choice. The Jewish leaders did which of the following to keep Jesus in the tomb? Did they secure it, put a seal on it? Did they place a guard around it? Did they do all of them? Raise your hand. Francine? She's right. They did all of these things. They secured it. It was sealed with a Roman seal, and they placed a guard around it. Thank you. Jesus' first words after his resurrection, as recorded by Matthew, were which of these? Another multiple choice. Which were the first words of Jesus recorded by Matthew out of the tomb? Was it, woman, why are you weeping? Go into all the world and preach. What were you talking about? Or do not be afraid. Which one did Jesus say first out of the tomb in the Gospel of Matthew? Do you remember? I see some elbowing and some... Oh, wait, I'm going to... Yeah, we're going to come back here to Amber. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I, I thought I saw you raise your hand. Was it a stretch, a yawn? You've got to be careful, like at an auction, I'm going to call on you. Juliet. It's not. Francine. It is do not be afraid. And you don't need to be afraid to answer. It's really okay. Now, these, these clearly were not the first words of Jesus, period, Okay, these are the first words as recorded in the Gospels, but I'm sure that he said other things as he came out of the tomb and as he interacted with people. So um, that, is, uh, that was it. So thank you very much for helping out and getting us started here in our journey of the story of the resurrection and some things that we can learn by it. Um, let's see if I can... So let's just start there. <laughs> we'll figure this out eventually. So let's just look to the Scriptures and read together. When it was evening... There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Go ahead. And Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb. Now, there's something very interesting about all four of the Gospels when it talks about this particular event in the life of Christ. They are very minimal in the details. Very minimal. Okay, and I think there's a reason for that. Now, just look at what we just read. He took the body, he wrapped it in a cloth, and laid it in a tomb. Okay? What did it take for him to do that? Right? Jesus was nailed to a cross. He had a crown of thorns on his head. All right? His body is covered in blood. Right? So when Joseph of Aaron, it sounds so sanitized. It sounds so simple. Just thank you for the body. Let's wrap it up uh, and, and put it in the tomb, and it's just an easy thing. This was an, an incredibly intimate thing that Joseph of Arimathea did. He had to pull those nine-inch spikes out of the wooden cross and get them out of the body of Jesus. He had to pull them out. or he, you know, He's a rich man. He probably had servants helping him, so you understand. Okay, He had to pull them out of his feet. 
okay? He had to take the crown of thorns off of his head. He had to, and you know, you ever wonder what happened to that crown of thorns? Was it just cast to the side? Did they put it somewhere? Did they put it in with the tomb? What about the sign that was above Jesus' head? It doesn't say. The scriptures, particularly around the crucifixion of Christ, give very minimal details, and I think there's reasons for that. Um, um, but uh, there's no harm in us at least talking about it. But I do think that the Bible wants us to be careful about obsessing about these things. Okay? Because what if the, he did uh, say something about the crown of thorns? Isn't it interesting how over the, the several thousands of years since this time, people have obsessed over, hey, I think I have a piece of the cross. Hey, I think I've got the Holy Grail. Hey, I think I've got the crown of thorns. And people will obsess over these things rather than on the most important part of it, which is the death of Jesus. So I think there's a reason why the scriptures minimize these details because we don't want to uh, make a pilgrimage necessarily to say, oh, I saw a piece of the metal spike that well, you know, was, was uh, used to, to crucify Jesus. That, that, we miss the point when we, when we do that. But I don't think there's anything wrong with at least uh, thinking about the reality of what happens in this story. Okay, And by, by the way, keep in mind, by him embracing and touching and interacting with the dead body of Jesus, it also made him unclean. He was willing to do that, even though that meant he could no longer participate in the remainder of the Sabbath or Passover activities because of his love for Jesus Christ. It made him ceremonially unclean. So when you start to think about it in these terms, it brings us a little bit more intimate into the story. And he laid him out in the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb, and he went away. Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sat opposite the grave. Oh, it worked that time. Now then, the next day, the day after the preparation, so we're now on the Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember, and I highlight this for a reason, I think it's incredibly ironic that the enemies of Christ remembered that Jesus said, I'm going to rise on the third day, but his closest intimate friends seem to have forgotten it. Isn't there a bit of irony to that? Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I'm going to rise again. Therefore, give orders that the grave be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples are going to come, steal him away, and say to the people, he's risen from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. So they were unwilling to allow Jesus to hang on the cross on the Sabbath, right? That would violate the Sabbath. We can't be doing that on the Sabbath. But they had no problems coming to Pilate on the Sabbath day and saying, we're gonna, we would like to, to negotiate with you this whole securing of the tomb. Uh, their hypocrisy knew no bounds, did it? Thank you very much. Pilate said to them, all right, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. Now notice what they did. They went and they made the grave secure along with a guard, and they set a seal on the stone. So I want you to picture it. We know the great big stone, and you've seen pictures, and you've read the stories before, rolled at the entrance of the grave. It was larger than what you know any single individual, for the most part, would be able to move. Okay, But now they're going to secure it. So they take ropes, they take straps, they take bindings, and they tie it over that stone. Then they take a Roman seal. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, I heard seal, and I thought someone took a caulking gun, you know, went and cock, sealed up the tomb, right? No, what it means is they took a clay tablet, and they pounded in, they melted it, and they pounded in a, a, a seal of the authority of the Roman government, all right? It was a sign that says anyone who breaks this seal and doesn't have the authority to break that seal, well, guess what? You might be the next one in the tomb. You're not supposed to do that. Right? So it had the authority of Rome on it. All the power and pomp and authority of Rome were buried in that seal. And then in addition to that, they put about, you know, we don't know how many guards. It was probably a, a standard cohort of guards would have been about 100 guards, right? Right there at the tomb. They did everything possible to keep Jesus in the tomb. They secured it. They sealed it with a government seal. And then they placed the authority of the government of Rome the guards of Rome also outside of that tomb, all because they did not want that tomb to be opened. They did not want that tomb to be opened. Now, there's an interesting thing about this. I just want to highlight this reality. One, we know he was dead. Jesus was dead. Okay, he did not swoon. He did not pass out. He wasn't in a coma, and he certainly wasn't faking it. He was dead. Dead. If there was one thing that the Romans were experts at, it was killing people. 
It was executions. They knew how to do it. And just to emphasize the fact, when Jesus was hung on the cross and, and it appeared that he was dead, the Pharisees told the Romans, we want to make sure of that. So the Roman soldier took that spear, slid it under his ribs as he hung there on the cross, and plunged it into his heart. Just to make sure that this was not a mistake. You know, people could hang on the cross for days. They would pass out. They would fall asleep. Okay, hanging on crosses. They had to make sure before they released and before they took him off the cross that this wasn't a mistake. So they slid that spear, plunged it into his heart. The blood and the water came out just to ensure that Jesus was dead. Now, I, 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 I emphasize this because there are still some people that don't quite understand or believe that Jesus died. But the scriptures are clear. Paul says, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died. For the ungodly. Romans says, for the wages of sin is what? If Jesus did not die, he did not pay my sins for my sins. And he didn't pay for yours either. Because the penalty and the wages of sin is death. And then the testimony of Jesus himself in the book of Revelation. Don't be afraid. I put it in red uh, because, you know, the words of Jesus are often in red in many Bibles. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. And I was dead no mistake no coma no faking i was dead and behold i am alive forevermore now the romans or excuse me the jews did everything they could to keep jesus in the tomb to keep that tomb sealed but they weren't the only ones interested in keeping that tomb sealed and secure who inspired them to kill Jesus in the first place? Who inspired them to secure the tomb in the first place? Do you think that Satan, after Jesus died on the cross, just simply said, hey, we've got this covered. We've won. It's over. It's time to party. Where do you think Satan was at this time? Where do you think all the demons of hell were at this time? Did Satan understand that this was part of God's plan from the beginning? You know, he'd had a lot of, there'd been a lot of ebbs and flows to the great controversy from its beginning when Satan was first cast out of heaven, when there was war in heaven, all right, and then he's cast out, okay? But then he, he has this victory in the Garden of Eden, and he seems to be that he's going to control things and goes all the way to the time of the flood, and he's got, look, I got this place. There's just this one family, just Noah. If I can take care of him, well, then I'm going to have full control here. But then God said judgment's going to come. He saves Noah and his family, and things start new. Okay, and all throughout the great controversy, there's this ebb and flow of victories and trials and challenges between God and between Satan. But when Jesus died on the cross, Satan thought he had scored the ultimate victory and he would not let anything steal that victory away from him. So where do you think he was at this time? Who inspired those Jews and those Romans to secure the tomb in the first place? On that day, on that Saturday, it was not just ropes and bindings. It was not just a government seal. It was not just Roman soldiers at the tomb on that day. You can bet and believe and trust and know that every demon of hell, every filthy spirit, every unclean fallen angel was also at that tomb with their hand on it, holding it in place. And the devil himself, who knew the prophecies, it was the devil who helped them remember that, that, that Jesus had said on the third day, I will rise. The devil himself stood before that tomb, holding it in place, doing everything possible to prevent the Son of God from coming out of the place of death. But did it work? <laughs> Let's read about it. He was dead, but he is alive. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first of the week, first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Now, I love the timing of God, as it says, as it began to dawn. And I think in my mind's eye, as I picture it, I see the first rays of sunlight cresting the horizon. And right as the first light of the sun begins to you know, wash over the plain there, and wash over the city, it was at that same time that the tomb burst open, right? And the light of the Son of God came bursting out of that tomb. These things, I see them coalescing. I do. I see them coming together. And I see God working within these, uh, these natural ways. And that earthquake occurs, 
and an angel of the Lord comes and, and descends upon it. So at the moment of the resurrection of Christ, and again, the Bible gives us few details, all right? So part of it, you have to just uh, imagine what it have been like. Those bindings and straps and ropes and secured, you know, whatever they used, uh, they must have just snapped apart, right? And that Roman seal, the authority of Rome, and, and all of the power of Rome that it represented, could it prevent that tomb from opening? And we'll read in just a second about those Roman soldiers. Were they able to do anything? And then even that great big stone that gets rolled away. I love how it says here that the angel came and, and the stone is rolled away. And what did the angel do? Sits right upon that stone. Almost in a, in a, in a kind of a, a, a way of seated on victory, Right? What do you do when you win a great battle? You know, you sit on the spoils of war, right? That's what you do when you sit. Um, uh, y- you declare, this has no power over me. This has no power to prevent anything. When that angel sat up there and squatted upon that stone, it was a way as if saying, there's nothing in this world that can keep Jesus in the tomb. We're going to be able to open this no problem. So that angel sat upon that rolled, that stone that was rolled over as a mark of victory. You know how Sitting Bull got his name? Do you know how Sitting Bull got his name? Well, there's several stories, but one of them is in uh, in one of the battles he had with the cavalry. When they were shooting at him, he went out right in front of the army and sat down. I mean, right in between with, with bullets flying by him, lit his pipe and casually smoked his pipe right as the bullets are whipping right by him. And then when he was done having his pipe, he went back to his lines. And so he was given the name Tatanka, 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 <laughs> Sitting Bull, because he was willing to sit on that field um, during that major battle to show he was not afraid. Uh, that was a side note, no charge for that. I love the angel sitting upon that stone. Just everything else is thrown away. What happened to those soldiers? Go ahead and hit it for me. And then as his appearance was like lightning, his clothing was as white as snow. The guards, here they go, they shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The, the, the you know, bravest soldiers of Rome here, they, they, they literally pass out. They don't die, okay, but they become like dead men. They're just, they're just fallen to the ground. And yet these women are there. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I always think that's kind of funny when God sends these powerful images, you know, and these revelations of his glory, and there's lightning, and there's brightness, and everything, and then he says, do not fear, right? Like, you could have done this a little different, right? You could have made it a little easier, but sometimes he wants us to see that power and the glory. Don't be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus who's been crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. They even say, you don't even have to take my word for it. Come and see. It's empty. You saw him buried here. He's not here. I'm here to tell you, he is alive. He is alive. All the power of hell was thrown back at the resurrection of Jesus and could not hold him in that tomb. So Satan lost. He was unable to keep Jesus in the tomb. But did he give up? Have you ever experienced a trial that you knew you were being tested with, that uh, you knew was not from the Lord, was from uh, some other power? Uh, The devil has not given up. And he simply changed strategies. If he can't keep Jesus in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, his next strategy is to keep him dead to you and to me and to his people. If I can't keep Jesus in the tomb in Jerusalem, I'm going to keep him in the tomb in the hearts of the people who claim to love and follow him. And that is the battle we are facing as believers today. Is Jesus really alive now to you? Or is it just a story? Is it just a a, a fun, common myth that we share with one another? Or do you really believe and entrust and place your hope in the Savior being alive today? Or is he dead? 
You know, even Paul understood that this would be uh, the challenge for people moving forward. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right? It's the resurrection chapter. We sometimes call it that. In 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm just going to begin in verse 12 here. I just have it in my Bible. I don't have it on the screen. Here's what Paul says. Now, if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not, listen to this, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith also is in vain. If Christ has not been raised, then everything we talk about in church is pointless. If Christ is not alive in our hearts and in our minds and in our homes and in our experiences, our faith is vanity. That's what he says. Moreover, we've even found to be false witnesses of God because we've said that God had raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. Verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. In verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. This was the challenge for the New Testament church. They would hear the message all the time. This was what the apostles, they were eyewitnesses to these things. And they would go out and they would tell the world, Christ has risen. And people still struggled to believe it. And it's the same struggle today in our hearts and minds. We as the believers of God, we as those who've embraced these stories, we read these, but do we really live as though Jesus is alive? Do we really trust that he is who he says he is? Do we look like a people who have been risen ourselves out of sin and out of corruption? Oh, sorry, I did want to um, read this one more part, and I, I have it here. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. You can hear kind of the broken heart of Paul here when he talks about this. We have a choice before us as believers. And that's why we are called believers. Every time we choose to avoid the temptations of sin, we are showing that Christ is alive in our hearts. Every time we sacrifice and give of ourselves and put the interests of others ahead of ourselves, we are showing that Christ is first in our lives and He's really alive. Every time we choose to come to church when we could do something else, you're showing that Christ is alive and he's in your hearts. But every time we give in to the selfish desires, every time we allow the habits and the, uh, the things that are uh, damaging to our heart to rule ourselves, rule our mind and to rule our actions and to rule our attitudes, it's evidence that we are denying the resurrection of Christ. Now, I'm not arguing for perfection here. We all have room to grow. But too often in the Christian church today, we look so much like the world who places no faith in Christ. And for many of us, it's, for many who, who are partakers and, and believers, it, it's hard-pressed to see any difference at all. When we should be like that shining light, we should be like that angel seated atop that stone in victory, shining bright like lightning and white, looking totally different than the darkness of the world around us. Is Christ really alive in your heart today? Have you really set aside the selfishness and the corruption that defines our fallen nature? We all struggle in areas in our life. We all have room to grow, as I said earlier. But the message of the cross and the message of the resurrection is that Jesus wants to not just have risen one time in history, but he wants to be alive in our hearts every single day. Paul says in Ephesians, I think is the next one, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and has seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in ages to come, that's now, right? 
We are, in, we are living the ages to come that Paul was talking about here. He might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Friends, Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's here with us. He's in our hearts. He's in this place. He's in our homes and in our families. He's in our schools. And when you turn to Christ, there is no power that can keep him dead in your life. No demon or devil, no snare or binding of sin, no government authority, no violent soldier can keep you apart from a risen Savior. The choice is simply yours. Will you believe? And will you make that an active belief that really changes you? Changes how you think. Changes how you act. Changes how you eat. Changes how you drive, Derek. Changes everything about us. And makes us like unto him. Jesus offers his hand to us all. He wants to help us along the way. Let's go to him now in prayer and ask him to help us. Heavenly Father, I know uh, most of us have heard many, many uh, sermons and lessons and uh, all kinds of messages before that talk about this great moment in the great controversy, this moment when you overcame, when you, you died and showed your love for everyone on the cross, when you were buried in the tomb, and that moment when you came out of the grave, and so many things that can be learned. But Father, right now I just pray that each and every person who can hear my voice, whether they're watching at home, online, whether they're in this place, would contemplate the reality that you want to be alive for us today. You were alive 2,000 years ago, and you are alive today. Help us to live like you're alive. Help us to live in such a way that your power is living through us. Lord, that is what makes the difference in these last days. That is what makes the difference in our life. We can't do this on our own. The more we struggle and try, the more we only find failure and brokenness. So Lord, help us all to be believers today and believe that you are alive. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, uh, everyone, I just want to thank you for being here and pray that the Lord bless you as you go and have you, as you have your other activities today and this weekend. Have a wonderful Sabbath, and we hope to see you tonight. Oh, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, so tonight, communion, again, at 6, you're all welcome. And then at 7, a business meeting. But I, I don't want you to think it just business sounds very bland. Uh, used to call these a heart-to-heart -heart meeting. It's a great time for just conversation and discussion and communication with the church family. So I hope that you can come tonight, and we'll see you then. God bless.